Hi, folks. I'm Rich Folley. We're back at the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. This is PBS Books coverage brought to you all weekend by PBS's new The Great American Read series. And I'm very privileged right now to be sitting with Robin Benway and Kate DiCamillo, two incredible authors writing for close to the same age audience, not exactly the same, but both award-winning. We'll talk about all that in a minute. First, welcome. Thank well, you. Thank you. Happy Rich. to be here again. And I, I just heard, because I introduced you, that you didn't know each other yet, so it's really cool no, to be able to no, introduce no, you. No, no, no. No, it's no. nice. I was very looking forward to meeting Kate, and yes. so far, so good. And, yeah. and, and it's um, uh, always a pleasure to have somebody to sit on this side of the couch <laughs> with you, because right. I'm just going to blame everything on, on yes, you. Know, Robin, I'll, how would you answer that, Robin? See, that's okay. how what I'm going to do that. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, there's like Alec Baldwin on Saturday Night Live. He's been on so many times. There's like some record-setting number or something. Kate, I, I'm going to break that record with you. I'm going to ask you anytime. <laughs> Every time Kate publishes anything, I'm like, can we have her? Can we have her? Um, let's start with you, Kate, because um, Ramey Nightingale was the last time we spoke, two-time Newbery Medal winner. Uh, Ramey Nightingale, your last book. You've, you're revisiting a new character. Last book, it sounds the, quite ominous. I know, actually, your last I say most novel. recent, yeah. I know, I think I've done this before, too. Uh, your last novel, uh, Ramey Nightingale, but there's a character, Louisiana, Louisiana Elefante, who you're revisiting in a new novel that's coming out in October. And it's amazing to me that you have, because you don't do this very often in your I novels, don't. find a character that you want to go back to. And the new book is actually called Louisiana's Way Home. It's coming out in October. What prompted you to want to go back and bring a character back? Well, and you said to find a character that you uh, want to go back to, and it's more like the character refused to shut up. You know, so it's just like you, it's like, and that has never quite happened before where I just could not get her voice out of my head. And it's also that her voice thing, um, it was, I've learned that uh, first person is always a difficult proposition, a, a hard way to tell a novel. And I haven't done it since my very uh, first book. And this character was so insistent about uh, it being in her, her voice. So it's first person. It's so. interesting because Ramey Clark, the, the main character, the protagonist of Ramey Nightingale, I felt like uh, I worried about her. I felt like she was a strong character and, and she was going to be okay ultimately. It's Louisiana that I worried about. She's like this frequently fainting, dramatic <laughs> human being. And I was like, my God, somebody take care of Louisiana. I mean, and then here you have her leaving her core group. In this new book, you have her leaving her friends, moving away from her friends in Florida to the new, new life in Georgia. And that sort of that group around her is where I'm worried about, like Louisiana. Am I wrong? Um, well, you sh you don't need to worry about her because she's the kind of person who insists on telling her story, even to little chipmunky writers like me. Right? I mean, she is so strong in her need to um, be and to be seen, and so she she will be fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm don't worry. Better. Yeah. I'm also, she better. can sing. Oh, that's so great. yeah, that's a great. That's yeah. Great. <laughs> Kate, Kate, you write to middle grade readers. Robin, your your book, Far from the Tree, which is in my hands right now, which won the National Book Award yeah. this past year, which is an amazing honor. Thank you. Um, is for a slightly older audience, but deals with some of the same issues. Your your main character, Grace, Maya, and Joaquin, uh, and it's about adoption. There've been some really tough elements within that story, but these three really find a bonding element. There's a deep friendship here. They turn to each other. Mm -hmm. And it's the same element, these kids turning to each other, not to anyone older or someone else in life, but finding solace in that sort of core friendship. Yeah, I think for siblings, I know a lot of it was based on my relationship with my sibling and just the way you have like this shorthand and this language almost, you know, the in-jokes that you grow up with and the lines from movies that you say to each other and even the dedication is in the book is to my brother and it's, uh, it's an in-joke that no one else will ever get except the two of us. And it's nice. I think having that language between siblings is really special. It's really rare. And I think especially in this book, as these three siblings are separated in the beginning and then come together, finding that language is something that unites them much more quickly than if they were just three strangers and yeah. unrelated. So all three of those characters, you live with them for so long as you're writing the story. Did, yeah. did, does it, do any of them present themselves in the same type of urgency that Louisiana did to Kate to you? Are you <laughs> was it hard to let go of them when you moved oh, on to the next? Oh, it was so, I haven't let go. You know, the book's been oh. out since October. And when it won the award, one of my first thoughts was, 
oh, I've got to tell Joaquin, I've got to tell Maya, you know, just, they're so, they become yeah. so no. real to you. Yeah. And especially for Far From the Tree, you know, I read that, I worked on that book much longer than any other book I've ever written. And in that case, I sat with those characters for much longer. And they were so private in the beginning that it took me a much longer time to get to know them. So I feel like I earned that knowledge and I feel very protective of it. And yeah. I, I, I wish someone else would write a sequel to this book. I don't want to write it, but I want to know what they're doing and where they're going. So I think yeah. your fans uh, I'll do write too. It. Do you want to write yeah. it? That would yeah. be, <laughs> it'd be better than the original. No, uh, that I is think, not true. You know, I, I think about too the name, the names for everybody. I always, I like, I always like to talk to Kate about like Louisiana, Louisiana Elefante. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I love the names that Kate comes up with. But when you think about these names, they're now people to you. They're real. They're real. Um, how do you decide what their names are going to be? Like, how do you decide when you're naming? It's just like a child, right? Yeah. But still, it's that process of going through and making a decision like that. You know, it sounds so strange, but they name themselves. Like, when I thought of this book, I was sitting in a car in a parking lot, and I just had this brainstorm of an idea. And immediately, I was like, Maya, Grace, and Joaquin. Like, that, those are their names, and that this is who they are. And it's a weird writer alchemy. It's that weird storm of... Oh my goodness! I've just met three new people. And you knew what was gonna when you had that moment. I did. You knew. I did, and wow. it was the strangest moment of my writing career. I was gonna yeah. say, does that happen no, to you? No, not at all. <laughs> and when you said no, that it's it usually took, torturous. It took you longer than it normally takes you. How long does it normally take you, and how long did this take? Uh, it took me about six months to write like a normal book, and this book took probably about a year and a half, oh. including research. I did a lot of research on adoption and foster care, birth mothers, adoptive families, and so the You're research... You're fast. That's really fast, though. <laughs> I'm yeah. glad someone thinks so. <laughs> but, but the idea of, of these characters presenting themselves to you, that's similar to the way you've described your characters to me, Kate. Like, when you're yeah, going to... Yeah, you never feel like you make them up. It mm -hmm. is not, no. you know, because kids will ask, how do you make up a character? How do you construct a character? And I'm always at a loss as to how um, to answer that question, because I always say I feel like they're real, and I just discover them. Mm -hmm. I, you know, or they they come looking for me, which makes you sound slightly crazy, but no. you know, yeah. You just turn it into a career, and it's fine. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but but Kate, you're in your career. These these characters are now popping up to you in different types of books. Um, we you know we know about uh, you know Flora and Ulysses, which was like sort of a graphic novel element. You've written about. You've written out kids' books where you have these wonderful characters that are recurring characters, pigs and toasts and things of that sort. I, I, like have you, a, I lead a very dignified life. <laughs> yeah. You get to revisit characters there, too. But this idea of um, creating these worlds that you get to now kind of visit and come back yeah. to and then dip out of and then come back into... It's an entirely new element of your career as you write. Well, and I think, and it's not intentional, but I think there's always a part of you that it's like you have to keep on doing things that you haven't done or else um, it's like, it's, it's that willingness to keep on opening doors because you have to keep on kind of challenging yourself with it. Do you feel yeah, that? Yeah, I, I think that's the nature of a creative person is you want to keep learning and discovering new ways to maybe tell a story, whether it's through art or books or right. graphic novels, whatever it is. That's just, I think, how a creative person's brain works is you're constantly looking for a new challenge. And, and you're constantly, uh, I, I, I am always like, I, I have found that there are lots of different doors to a story, and that's something that it's taken me a while to mm -hmm. figure out. Mm -hmm. That there's, it, there, I always used to think there was just one door, and now I can see that there are lots of ways to get in, and that's very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and both of you, um, mine, challenging parts of a child's life, those areas of their life where like they don't, where they're uncertain where they're maybe even scared or where maybe something traumatic has happened to them. Mm -hmm. And you both do it sort of fearlessly. And uh, I recently Matt Filipeña wrote something that, Kate, you responded to or you wrote about, um, you know, that, it's, that, that children's books should be a little sad, mm -hmm. that books for young readers in general, um, it's okay to go there and that you shouldn't be afraid of that. And I, I wanted both of you to talk about it because it's a big part of YA literature, right? Sort of like exposing the sort of raw nerve that lies underneath everyone's lives and sort of putting it out there. And that just seems to be part of it. But even for the middle grade reader where you're, it can be frightening at times. And adults maybe are worried about exposing their kids to some of these things in, in both, for both of you. And I wanted to talk to you both about that concept of, of going there, of not being fearful of the things that are, you can be afraid of. 
We'll start with you, Robin. Um, I just think it's a mistake to hide pain or fear from children because they're experiencing it. And to hide it from them sort of makes it seem like it's shameful or a secret. And I think the best thing that art for kids can do is create a safe space for them to explore those feelings, talk about those feelings. And I think for YA, you know, we see so many dystopian novels, so many big worlds. And it's not about dystopia. It's about the feeling that your world is changing and how do you cope with that. And I think um, metaphors like that work so well in children's literature because I think they're so open open to that, and I think kids, once given the platform, can really speak to the fears that they have, and it helps them be able to address them as they grow up and become adults and not be afraid of it. And I think Kate's piece in time just spoke so beautifully to that. I loved that piece. Oh. I cried so much when I read that piece. I thought oh, it was so beautiful. I, I, it, 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 what Matt wrote was so beautiful mm -hmm. that it was like, not, I, I, I felt like I, I had to write something, and I don't know if I lived up to what he did, but <laughs> I do want to say that that's, you know, it, it's also that thing of, um, with Matt's book, with, with um, the, the kid hiding under the piano, what that would have meant to, to me as a kid, um, who, because when um, things are happening in the house that you feel aren't right, um, you think it's only happening here, yes. and therefore there's something wrong uh, in this house and with me. Um, and if you see it in a book, um, then you don't feel alone anymore, and, and, it, and it gives you a way to talk about it, and I think that that's um, so important. But it sometimes happens outside of the, the family purview, right? It's not mom and dad kind of trying to make your child feel better or your, your beloved aunt or your next-door neighbor who's watching out for you. It comes through this person they don't know, oftentimes you, or that they feel like they know you because they're reading your books. But it's this other doorway for understanding and empathy that they can turn to. And I think that scares some parents, right? Because it's happening in this world that they're not inside of necessarily. They don't read every one of those books. They don't know everything that's happening. And yet that's where the kids so often are turning to, to find answers and, and understanding, it seems yeah. to me. I think that's what makes our job so special is that we get to be the carrier for a message like that and we get to be a safe place for a kid like that. I mean, I think that's where the honor comes in in the work that we do. I yeah, think. I think that's a, a wonderful point. And I also think that the point that Matt made in his original piece about how um, if you're a child that isn't experiencing any of these things, then what better way to, to learn about them than it, within the safe confines of a book? And if you're a young child, in, within the circle of your parents' arms mm -hmm. as they read to you. So because it's that empathy, right, which is another thing that we get to participate in. So and, and that matters so much. A, a book can teach you empathy mm -hmm. um, because you put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And it, it seems to me then there's this other element, this gatekeeper component sometimes, the librarians, the teachers, the, not gatekeepers, but the stamp of approval people that say, this one might be good for you. You mm -hmm. should try that. Or the booksellers that actually can hand you the book because they can see something that maybe makes sense. And they actually know the stuff. They know what's inside these books. And they can be that sort of connective tissue. We love them. those people who we put do. those books <laughs> in those kids' hands, yeah, and who see the kids and, and know the books and know how to, that. We love those we people. Do. It takes yeah. a village, yeah. for sure. <laughs> it really yeah. does. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the other element is both of the communities you guys come from are so supportive, right? There's like this world yes. that lives in middle grade. Kate, you were looking at Jason Reynolds' book, and you're looking we at... We love yeah, Jason. Yep. Jason's having... He was here yesterday, and <laughs> is like seems to be writing for a lot of different age groups, too, yeah. both young adult and middle grade, and he's having fun with both. It does seem like there's this new crop of writers out there, and, and Kate, you've been around for a long time, Robin, you too, that are now coming into the scene they're having an immediate impact that people are just finding this, this wealth. This, there's so many niches and there's so many opportunities. Jason talks about the fact that when he was younger, and Kate, you just said it when you're talking about Matt Little Payne's book, if you were younger, that he didn't have those kind of books. And now these people are delivering these books in the lives of kids mm -hmm. where they can find something that feels like them, that looks right. like them, yeah. Yeah. or that has an experience, Kate, like Matt, like you talked about under the piano. What an important thing for kids who maybe, in, in the changing nature of literature for kids now. Yeah. Continually evolving. It, it is a golden age, uh, it, it, or the beginning of one, and being able to find yourself in a book. Um, yeah. I think it's a watershed moment, and it's something that has been a long time coming, and is long overdue, and I just love seeing, I mean, when I 
I'm sure you feel the same way when you go to panels, when you see kids, it's so many different kinds of kids. And that is so important because they shouldn't yeah. be able to be exposed. Everyone should see themselves on the cover of a book and inside the pages of that yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah. We all want to find ourselves in a book. We and do. I think that you, uh, <laughs> one of the things, I'll, the last thing we can talk about today is an event like this where you walk around and you see thousands and thousands of people who are here for something called a book festival, which is amazing <laughs> to me. It warms my heart like I can't even tell you. Uh, but the idea that people are still seeking out, I know we hear stories about fewer people reading. What is your sense as you're looking out into the world and, and the way you're seeing with the, your readers and kids in general? Boy, I don't, I don't feel it. I feel like books matter now oh. more than ever. Is what, and, and like you said, I've been doing it uh, this is 18 years now. And um, not only the stories, but people needing to gather around the stories. I feel like that is more important than, than ever. Than ever, absolutely. And, you know, I work primarily with teenagers, and I see teen readers. They devour books. You know, if they've only read 200 books in a year, they're, they're disappointed. You know, it's amazing to watch. And that's how I devoured books as a child as well. I loved reading. And I think we have to remember that the way people consume stories changes, but the the fact that they are consuming those stories doesn't change. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. So it's wonderful to have you both. Kate, I should take co uh, some uh, consolation in the fact that it's Louisiana's way home. So I'm feeling like <laughs> she's going to make it. It's a promising title, yeah, it, is, right? it really yes. is. So I'm going to yeah. feel better about Louisiana. <laughs> she may be fainting somewhere, but she's going to make it. She's going to be okay. Thank you for consoling me. No spoilers. Yeah. No spoilers. And, and Robin, far from the tree, I can't wait to see what comes next for you. Thank you. Um, me it's too. It's really exciting. <laughs> and I'm sure you're working on it. We're going to hit you up again when you can tell us more. <laughs> But uh, it's so cool to have you both together. I love what you both do, and thank you so much for your contributions to kids' literature. It's so important. Thank so, you so much for having us. It's been wonderful. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it so yeah, much. Always. Thank you.